Yeah. It's a special pleasure to introduce uh, Greg Dowler to those of you who haven't met him uh, in the department because he's also a member of it. Greg got his PhD in theoretical astrophysics at the University of Pennsylvania, and after that he spent uh, a couple of years at Harvard, CFA, and then in Santa Barbara, uh, doing really interesting stuff in astrophysics, and not only you know doing stuff, but also discovering very interesting stuff. And you heard uh, a number of talks on what's called the Fermi bubbles, and actually Greg discovered those Fermi bubbles. Uh, and since then, he decided to apply his knowledge and skills. Uh, in a very different area, but also somewhat related, and that your studies, or your urban studies, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, there's lots of interesting stuff going on there, lots of uh, important physics and applications of the uh, skills that you acquire in, in any theoretical subjects, especially involving the data science. So this is for students who might be interested in that sort of stuff, and uh, Greg is going to tell us today about uh, what he's been doing for the last couple of years at CASP. Yeah. All right, great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, it's really great to be here. It's great to be talking to you all. Uh, so yeah, as Greg mentioned, uh, a couple of years ago, I sort of made this uh, dramatic transformation away from astronomy into uh, this, uh, what is an emerging field called uh, urban science. And I'll get a little bit into what, into what that means. But a lot, of, a lot of sort of what I was doing before was sort of directly applicable to what I'm doing now. And so what I'm going to do today is, uh, I'm going to go through a little bit of sort of how uh, physics and not just not just like not just physics uh, fundamentals, you know, things like gravity and and motion and all that kind of stuff, electromagnetism, etc. Um, not just physics concepts as physics themselves, but as as physics methodology, as physics lines of inquiry, as physics way of thinking, uh, can inform sort of other studies, right? And so what I'm going to show you is sort of, it does involve physics. There are physical concepts that are in here and that will pop up throughout. And you can sort of see some direct relationships of where physics comes into sort of studying the city. Um, but also the, the lines of inquiry and the way that sort of physicists approach problems. Uh, we'll sort of go through that uh, uh, throughout the talk. So this is, um, so yeah, so I'm Greg Dobler. Uh, so my official title within CUSP, so CUSP stands for the Center for Urban Science and Progress, which I'll talk, I'll say a little bit about in a second. Uh, but it's a center within NYU. We are housed uh, over across the, uh, across the river in Brooklyn. Um, so my official title there is as the Associate Director for Physical Sciences, but um, I'm not totally sure what it means, um, but I do, uh, you'll, you'll get a sense for sort of uh, the kinds of things that sort of go into that throughout. So this is a picture of Manhattan taken from Brooklyn. Uh, that's the Empire State Building. Uh, that's Chrysler Building. These are two images actually. One of them is during sunset, uh, and the sun is sort of setting over here, and it's, uh, it's reflecting off of the top of the Empire State Building. And over here it's uh, nighttime, and this is just a sort of blend between the two. So before I actually get into the, the kind of researchy stuff that I do, let me tell you a little bit about CUSP um, uh, in case you're not sort of familiar with it. So CUSP is only a couple of years old. It's very young, um, but we've come a long way in the last couple of years. So just to give you an idea, so CUSP is sort of, it's a mission-driven uh, center. So when it was founded, it has a couple of sort of core mission statements. Um, one of them being to advance, the, uh, advance what's called urban science or urban informatics now, which is basically the study of the city as a system, right? So just like any other system that you study, the study of the city as a system, but also to sort of help, uh, to help the city um, in terms of its operations, to sort of work with the city in using the kinds of things we do to make uh, sort of cities more productive, livable, equitable, resilient, etc. So how we do that, right? So CUSP, uh, we, get, we, we basically do a lot of, a lot of work with data. Um, that data comes in all kinds of forms. It comes in the forms of records data from the city. It comes in the form of data that we generate ourselves from sensors, which is essentially going to be everything I'm talking about today. Um, and it comes uh, in the form of uh, both open data, data that's publicly available, and data from agency partners of ours that's not publicly available. So we are a degree granting center. So we have a master's program where we grant degrees in uh, urban informatics. Um, the first cohort came in uh, right as I was coming in two years ago. There were 20 students. Uh, this year we have 90 students. So a uh, dramatic increase. 
so the way that we do this, right, so the, the what is urban informatics in the context of cities? So it's basically sort of very data science oriented. We have data, we have domains, we have disciplines, and that's basically urban informatics. So for those who aren't sort of familiar with this kind of lingo, domains basically means the what you're doing, things like transportation or energy or what have you. And the disciplines is kind of like the how, like the um, uh, software writing, visualization tools, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so the question is, how did I, as somebody who worked for a decade in astrophysics, get involved in this kind of thing? Um, I will, I will defer that question for a couple of slides. Um, but first, let me say, why, 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 should, why should you care at all about cities? Um, it's a really good question. Um, this, is, uh, this is a number that's, that I did not know about before I started working on this. But about 80% of the US population currently lives in cities. And about 50% of the world's population lives in cities. And those numbers are increasing dramatically. So now you can say, well, what defines a city? Uh, it's true that these numbers are a little fuzzy because, yes. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of now sort of famous slash infamous quote by Jeff West, who is a physicist at the Santa Fe Institute, who did some work on uh, sort of approaching cities as, uh, as a physical system and looking at scaling laws between some of the data, that, data sets that were out there. And the quote was that cities are the source of, of humanity's problems, but they're also the source of the solutions, right? So when you sort of have concentrated humanity like this, it causes issues uh, related to spikes in energy consumption and environmental consequences, et cetera. Um, but when you put so many people together, you have lots of sort of technological revolution um, that can be very useful. So the city is actually a complex system. Um, and uh, so the, this is uh, sort of one of the sort of nicest pictures I could find of the city where it uh, sh shows the three components of the system. Right? So those three components are the built structures, so these guys, the buildings, uh, the natural environment, which uh, uh, so essentially things like vegetation, wildlife, the, atmos uh, the, the atmosphere, etc., uh, and humans, right? People. And these three components, they interact a lot, right? So uh, those interactions lead to uh, all of the sort of complex systems phenomenology you might think of, like emergent phenomena. There are these system interdependencies. There's all kinds of complicated, uh, all kinds of complicated interactions. So the city itself can be thought of as a complex system. And what I'm going to do in a bit is I'm going to go through sort of how I approach that um, the city from that perspective using. Uh, sort of some of the techniques from astronomy and physics. Uh, right. So uh, let me quickly just say, uh, sort of Aristotle was sort of the first one to think of what I'm about to do. Uh, so it's, uh, his quote was, uh, to learn about the city, we must observe it. So, uh, right, so Aristotle was like the guy who coined the term physics. Um, but, you know, we should maybe take this with a grain of salt. This quote actually came from his book called Politics. So uh, this, is probably, this quote is probably more relevant to pollsters than it is to uh, physicists, and especially because his idea of physics was a little different from what our idea of physics is now. But let's just run with that. Um, OK. So uh, two years ago, uh, I decided that I wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, but I knew that there was a certain set of skills that I had from astronomy and physics, and I was looking for different things, uh, different sort of avenues to lines of inquiry that, that I could sort of get into that would exploit those skills. And um, through a couple of mutual acquaintances, I met the director of CUSP. The director of CUSP is Steve Coonan, who gave a talk here about CUSP about two years ago. Lots happened since then, which I'll go through. Um, and you know, the, basically, the thing that convinced me was he showed me what I'm about to show you here. So he and uh, Masood Gandhari, who is um, the head of a facility at CUSP called the Urban Observatory, which I'll talk a lot more about in a second. Um, basically took a 24-hour time lapse of the view from the CUSP office, which is, which is that view. Um, and so Steve, I'll, I'm going to go through the video, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll show you the different pieces of it and describe sort of what we're seeing. Um, but Steve, you know, I met with Steve, and I talked to him, and I said, and he said, OK, you're an astronomer. What could you do with this? Here's a bunch of imaging data. What, does an, what can an astronomer do? What can you learn about that object, which is out there, based on what we're seeing from here? Because after all, that's what you do in astronomy. You have objects that are out there. You learn about them by taking pictures of them from here. So what can you do with that? So here was the video. And here's, uh, here's just sort of, I'll just sort of describe qualitatively some of the things going on. So the first thing you can see is there's lots of building lights, right? So these very bright building lights. There are these sort of point sources that are throughout the scene that are twinkling. They're going on and off. 
um, very much like stars. And there's a, you know, you could ask the question of whether or not there are sort of patterns there. There are window lights, there are these street lights, there's a, there's a stoplight. You can see the cars going along the road. You can see the lights that are along the river that are splashing up off the water and projecting light pollution onto some of the buildings uh, along the riverway. Uh, and then it transitions to daytime and it's a completely different set of phenomenology, right? So as the sun goes overhead, you can see the shadows changing on the buildings. Now you can really see the cars going along the highway, you can see the boats going along the river. If you squint, you can kind of see there's a crane over there. Uh, in a second, the, uh, there's going to be clouds, here they come, they roll over and they cast shadows themselves. So it's a different kind of shadowing problem than just the geometry of the city casting shadows. And then the thing transitions back to night and it starts all over again. So some of the things we first started talking about was, okay, well, you know, when you think of astronomy, you think, okay, let me, you think of stars, so let me think about brightnesses of stars. Um, and so one of the first questions we said was, was there sort of patterns of, patterns of twinklings of these lights uh, in the city? Um, that would all be well and good, but why would you want to do that? I'll get into that in a second. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Also, in, but, okay, so another piece of astronomy uh, is essentially um, trying to quantify information about the object that you're looking at, right? So characterizing, and so say you're looking at a pulsating star, right? So what's the, what is the sort of underlying mechanism that is, is resulting in the pulsations, right? What is the energy budget of the star, for example, right? Um, so yes, there is, there is a certain amount of hypothesis testing that is going on and that will be done in the future. Before, before I get into any of it, okay, let me just preface things by saying we're also in the very early days and maybe the way to start thinking about this is like Sloan circa like 1998 where we're starting to build out this capacity and we're, we're, we're exploring the possibilities for the kinds of things we can observe and the kinds of things we can measure. And then the, the implications for what those are will involve, will involve more sort of directed study as time goes on. Does that make sense? Okay. So, right, so this thing that was in this video, the concept that as it existed at the time was this urban observatory, which is very much like an astronomical observatory, you know, as I, as I sort of described before, um, you know, take pictures of the sky, figure out what's going on, take pictures of the city, figure out what's going on. So the idea was that this would be sort of a unique user facility, right? So in the end, in the sort of long-term goal here, um, scientists who, as the study of cities comes into its own, scientists who want to study cities can use this as a way of studying cities um, through sort of persistent and synoptic observations. So persistent meaning uh, continuously in time. Synoptic means seeing, uh, well, all seeing, but really a lot, seeing a lot. Um, and so we wanted to, as I said before, sort of advance the urban science concept, but then we also want to use this, and I'll give you examples of how we can do that, um, uh, as a way of sort of improving quality of life and city operations and things like that. So the instrumentation itself um, is uh, basically, we've, are, we've started exploring many different sort of avenues, sort of all the ways one might think to observe uh, the city in a way that you might observe the sky. So visible wavelength observations, so here's a, a model of a camera that we use. No, not very much different from the camera in your cell phone. Roughly same number of pixels and sensitivity, but it's networked so we can actually pipe images back through us doing remote observing. Uh, infrared observations, and we'll get into that a little bit more uh, in a bit. And hyperspectral observations, where we break up the incoming light into many, many, many wavelengths. So one of the great things about this, though, which is a little bit different from astronomy is um, not only can you take imaging and try to infer things from imaging, but you have the added benefit that there's lots of other data out there about the object that you're studying that comes from within the object itself. Records data, sensors data that's sort of in situ, so within the object, um, that you can then bring to bear against these uh, observations, which I'll describe in a minute. And again here the mantra is sort of uh, persistent synoptic and granular. So continuously doing this over time, having fine enough resolution in, in sort of space and time to actually be able to do some of the science I'm going to talk about. And granular, uh, in, uh, uh, granular in the sense of, uh, sorry, synoptic in terms of all seeing and then granular in the sense of having enough resolution to do what I'm about to say. So just, uh, just a, a quick point of the kinds of things we're looking at. 
So uh, CUSP is down here. The observatory is sort of pointed, uh, the initial sites were sort of, we're building out the sort of next stage, uh, sort of pointed this direction. Uh, so this is, the, this is the image we're looking at before. This is the Empire State Building over here, Chrysler Building over here. And this is sort of the, the direction we're looking at. What we're actually seeing in this image, I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. But for the visible observations, like I said, it's just a basic camera, eight megapixels. Um, we've been taking these, the very first thing I did when I got there, I said, okay, well, let's start doing this for real. Let's start taking images. Let's write a data processing pipeline, which I'll describe. Um, and let's actually do it as if we were going to be doing an astronomical survey. So we've been doing this for about two years and we have about 100 terabytes worth of the same scene, actually. All right, so there are a couple of use cases that uh, immediately pop to mind. Um, so urban energy and the environmental impacts of its use, uh, sort of two sort of very pressing problems uh, in, in the field of cities as they sort of advance into the future, but also pressing problems for the city itself. All right, so let's start off with energy. Um, this, was, uh, this was from a paper by Konstantin Kantakosta, who is uh, a professor at CUSP also, uh, urban planner who works on building informatics. Uh, there is a data set that is publicly available called the Local Law 84 data set. The Local Law 84 data set, um, Local Law 84 is a law that mandates that all buildings over 50,000 square feet uh, report annually the amount of energy they use and the type of, oil, the type of, uh, the, uh, type of fuel that they use to produce that energy. Um, and the, uh, so this is essentially a, a distribution of, uh, of the commercial buildings and this is a distribution of the residential buildings. Uh, and you can see they're sort of, uh, sort of reasonably Gaussian with some tails and some outliers. But the interesting thing was, so he built this model where he took a bunch of building characteristics and regressed it against how much energy was being used. And it turned out that by far the most important uh, uh, parameter in this model was the occupancy. So this immediately begs the question, okay, well, um, the data is a little bit sparse. It's only for buildings that are so large. Um, and occupancy is kind of a hard thing to actually sort of, you can, you can say, well, a building has this many units. So over the course of a year, this is annual data. Over the course of a year, um, maybe we can estimate the occupancy. But can you actually measure, uh, say, the occupancy on granular timescales? If you can do that, and occupancy is correlated with energy consumption, can you then measure energy consumption on short timescales? Okay. So that was sort of the, the sort, of first, uh, sort of first thought. Um, so uh, how might we measure occupancy? Well, those lights were all sort of twinkling. So can we use the technique sort of from astronomy uh, to say, look at those lights and look at time series of those lights to look for patterns in the lights that we can then say correlate with energy consumption? So I'll tell you right off the bat, we're not going to get to the end goal, but I'm going to show you how we're sort of going about that process and how especially uh, the difficult question of how to actually tie that back into records data. So before I, before I do any of that though, let me point out um, privacy. Whenever you uh, start talking about taking pictures at night, privacy is, uh, always comes up. So that's a big concern, obviously. Um, we take privacy very, very seriously at cusp. It's sort of a paramount importance. Um, every, all of our projects that we do that involve non-open data uh, go through the IRB process. We have uh, Chief Data Officer Julia Lane that oversees the security. Non-open data. Non data can be, uh, so open data meaning uh, data that is out in the public domain. So like are your pictures that you're taking from the roof open data? They are not open data. So they are not in the public domain. Did you ask people if you can do this? No. Now, you talk about there's astronomy and what you're doing, right? Yes, correct. If I take a telescope and yeah. point at the stars, I'm yeah. a scientist. That's right. If I take a telescope and point at my neighbor's window, I'm a computer. Yeah. Have to explain that. He's going yeah. to address right. that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, <laughs> correct. You could very well, you could, very, you could absolutely be a creep and go outside and start, you know, pointing a telescope in somebody's window. And that is, in fact, a violation of, of the law. Right. Don't most knowing New Yorkers have a pair of binoculars in their... Uh... <laughs> I do not have a pair of binoculars uh, in my uh, apartment. Um, but, so, when we go through the IRB process, the end result is that for these images, uh, we have to have a limited number of pixels uh, per window. And uh, not only that, 
The atmosphere actually does this one better because it tends to blur things out. So at the bottom right here is a zoom in of sort of two of the closest windows in the scene. So this is essentially what we're looking at and you can't really, you, there's, you, can't, you can't essentially see anything. Craig, you might yep. So the so it's essentially sort of uh, an overseeing board that has to approve uh, research on human subjects. Right. So this is not something that physicists typically have to deal with, right? So, but uh, when you sort of get into uh, when you get into sort of combining these kinds of things with social science or anything that might involve people, um, this project actually technically doesn't officially need to go through an IRB, but we went through the IRB process anyway. Um, all of the analysis we also do is aggregate and de-identified. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And the IRB is at a high level within NYU. Yes, the IRB is at a high level within NYU. That's right. But somewhere you are storing on a server, whether everyone is home or not. If you want to, if you want to do analysis on these images, absolutely, one can take data sets. One can take many different kinds of data sets and use them in a way that is. Um, that either violates somebody's privacy, or is against the law, uh, or is for nefarious purposes. That's for, that's for sure. And so one of, the reasons, one of the reasons that data like this is very protected within CUSP uh, is because, you know, the question about opening up this kind of data generally brings up questions like, well, can somebody use this kind of data to, do, to, to essentially invade somebody's privacy and do something bad? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so. Uh, what do we have to do? So the first thing we have to do is, so the camera is on a roof and the wind is blowing and so the thing shakes around. So we're taking an image once every 10 seconds. So we take a picture, the camera blows around a little bit, take another picture. Those two pictures are offset. The first thing we have to do is sort of register them so that they're lined up so that we can actually do uh, sort of a coherent analysis, image registration. Uh, then uh, the very first thing I did is I sort of went in by hand and picked out uh, 4,200 of the light sources in the scene. They look like that. There's about 20,000. This took a long time to do. I will never do it again. We have better ways of doing this now that have to do with temporal correlations of neighboring pixels. Um, and then for each frame, we calculate the average brightness in each of these apertures. So this is like doing uh, photometry in astronomy, right? Um, so now we do that for each frame and so we stack them together and what that eventually gives you is a quote-unquote light curve for each of these sources. So brightness is a function of time. So here's an example of one of those guys. Uh, I have no idea which one it is. I picked it at random. So, uh, so here's from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. and this is some light source. And it's on for a while. It goes off a little bit. Uh, and then it has this sort of big off right here around 11.30ish. And off for a while, there's a uh, short little on period, and then off again. Anything could be going on in here. Uh, we don't care. You can make up any story you want to about what's actually happening. Uh, a person could come home, watch TV for a while, turn off the TV and read, go to bed, wake up and go to the bathroom, come home, leave all the, light, come home, leave all the lights on and go out. Well, I realize they left all the lights on, come home, turn one off. Could be an interior room that goes off. Anything could be happening. We have no idea. Um, but these on and off transitions here, those guys are signaling uh, activity. It's telling you something about occupancy of the place, which is the thing that we're sort of after here. And in aggregate, this tells you something about behavioral properties, which can then sort of be correlated with energy consumption. So the first thing we did was so we broke this up into two sort of subsets, commercial and residential. Um, and so uh, these aren't pure, so we just sort of drew a line. We have a better way of separating these now, which I'll talk about in a second. But if we just sort of look at sort of the bottom half of this and say, okay, so now here's about 1,200 of those light sources as a function of time of night. Here's the brightness as a function of time. You can see it looks quite random. And so it can be, the question is, is there some underlying pattern here that we can then, uh, that we can then use as a correlate for energy consumption or as a proxy for occupancy, right? So what about if we order them according to this sort of final off transition? So this orange one here, uh, sort of special, right? It's the off transition that sort of maximizes this difference, which is the mean brightness before versus mean brightness after, right? So we wrote the, wrote the algorithm to go through all of these uh, for, for a couple of weeks, calculate all these on and off transitions, uh, and identify which one was sort of the big off. So again, this has no implication of behavior. It could be a person going to bed, it could not be. Um, but basically, it has, it's, it's some information about sort of power down, right? It's kind of like the end of the night kind of thing. So if you plop those down right here, you can see, for example, like on, 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 big off kind of thing. So if you order these guys according to that big off transition, is there a pattern? Yes, there is. Yeah, those are the big offs. That's basically when the thing turns off, 
So that's this. So for example, this is where the average brightness before versus after is maximized. So if you order them according to that, yes, there is a very clear pattern. It's not random. If it was random, it'd be a straight line, but it's not. There's sort of this, there's sort of this curvature to it. So I'll take a brief aside, and you can ask a sort of sociological question here and say, well, are people creatures of habit? If you go to the next night, uh, so this is ordered according to these big off times. This is a Monday. If you go to Tuesday and say, well, uh, are people creatures of habit? If they are, then this should look essentially the same. Uh, it doesn't, so there's essentially this disordering from one night to the next. Some of the underlying structure, but not exactly. Um, so in that sense, no, they're not. But if you say, forget about what happened, yeah, yeah go ahead. Each horizontal line and one picture is... Is one light source. Same horizontal line and the other picture. Exactly, from top to bottom, right. So that's two different nights of the same sources ordered the same way. But now if I say, well, forget about what happened yesterday, let me just order these guys according to these big off times like before, you get, this, you get the pattern back. So in another sense, people are creatures of habit. In a sense, the aggregate is essentially, uh, has essentially a recurring pattern, but the underlying, uh, the underlying individuals which make it up, they don't occur. It's kind of like a gas, right? You have some state, and then the underlying particles which make up that state are more random. Yeah? How is, wouldn't, wouldn't you better question how people behave when you go from Monday to next Monday? Yes, so I don't have the plot here, but it looks exactly the same. So going from Monday to Monday, you have essentially this complete break, this, this breakup, this randomization. But then if you order it, the pattern is exactly the same. So it looks just like you could replace Tuesday with Monday here, Monday plus seven. There, there's just other ways other than like saying, look, this is ordering for you, something looks the same. And there are information theoretic techniques yep. that would actually let you know how much the Monday behavior predicts the Tuesday behavior. Exactly. exactly. Yes. That's right. And so using those, you say there's no information? That's, for, for a given source? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's some. So, okay, so this, so this is the pattern essentially repeated day after day, and this is the breakup. This is what you're looking at before without the curves. So you can then ask, okay, well, what if you go from one day to the next, right? How much do things change? What fraction of the, what fraction of the sort of population changes by a lot versus a little, right? So this is a quantification of that. So in orange is going from one day to the next, in red is one day to two days later, and blue is one day to uh, three days later, and you're just comparing for a given source what is the change of its sort of big off times, and then bidding them up according to changes in time. So for example here, uh, this is, these are sources that from this orange dot here, that from uh, one day to the next are within, uh, have a change of two hours in their sort of big off time. So, Two things, first of all, the randomness doesn't essentially change in time. The system becomes as disordered as it does in one day. Uh, in one day, it stays essentially that disordered. So the memory of the system is essentially one day. Um, but then, you know, you can sort of say, well, what fraction of the population sort of does have these sort of big off times that vary by a lot? And about 20% are within sort of plus or minus 15 minutes, and another 50% are within plus or minus sort of two hours. So there is a component here that has a sort of regularity, that has more regularity to it than another. <laughs> right, so um, the patterns on the weekends look a little bit different. Um, they're a little bit more random, so there's not quite so much nice curvature to them. Uh, they're a little bit more random, but they essentially do obey this sort of same thing where if they have, say, a Saturday and a uh, Friday night and a Saturday night, they're very similar. Um, but they look a little bit different than a Monday and a Tuesday. Correct. Yep. Right, so this thing is essentially, this thing is essentially, is essentially reasonably well fit by a broken power law. Um, we don't have a model for how to sort of explain that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, so you can, you can essentially fit this by a broken power law. What time of year was this done? Uh, this was done in November. So if you do this, uh, this is now three weeks. Uh, like I said, we have two years, but we, at, at the moment we're sort of uh, up to about three weeks um, worth of data that was in this paper. Uh, so, there's this, so the light oranges are all the offs, the dark oranges are the big offs. The light blues are the, uh, all of the ons, and the dark blues are the sort of big ons defined analogously. And you can sort of see this, you can sort of see this pulse, right? This sort of pattern that happens day after day. There's less activity on the weekends than there is on the weekdays. Um, and so, you know, one of the interesting things to sort of think about here is, it actually turns out that if you line these curves up, you know, I'm not saying uh, anything about, uh, about you know, bedtime versus non-bedtime, but if you sort of line these curves up with what are considered sort of characteristic building load curves, uh, they line up very nicely, actually, um, giving us some hope that this can, uh, this can be a tracer of energy consumption.
Um, just as an aside, Jawbone, these are the fitness tracker guys, uh, they uh, recently did some analysis on their data where they published sort of bedtimes for, uh, for uh, different cities throughout the world. And uh, it turns out that uh, New Yorkers go to bed right around 11.30, which is where we sort of see our peak of off times uh, for what it's worth, totally anecdotal. So, um, yeah. Ah, I'm glad you asked. Conet has no idea. Um, yeah, so uh, this was actually quite shocking to me as well. So um, the way the, so the city, the electric power grid, for example, is a meshed network within the city. So there are these feeders that feed these transformers, and then these transformers are connected through a non-one-to-one -to -one matching, uh, matching mesh, right? And the individual buildings are metered at monthly timescales. The transformers are metered at 15 minute time scales, but uh, it's, uh, it's non-trivial and potentially not even possible to invert that problem and get out the loads from the individual buildings just because it's under constrained. Um, so, you know, Con Ed recognizes this is a problem and they have this plan to roll out these smart meters. They want to put out a, a smart meter in all one million buildings in New York over the next 10 years at a cost of about one and a half billion dollars. So um, the hope is here that, you know, that's definitely, that's, well, that's probably going to happen. Um, the hope is here that we can sort of develop a technology that can sort of measure the energy consumption of a city from a distance without sort of going in and saying like, we're going to put this in your house kind of thing. Um, and then sort of deploy that to other cities as well. So about that energy use. Um, so how do we actually do that? So if these are our light patterns and we want to say, correlate light patterns with energy consumption. How do you do that? Here's like, this is like a thousand buildings almost in this scene. How do you actually break that up? Um, and so, you know, how can you take a picture of the scene? How can you essentially do the image segmentation? So, um, what I did was I took the LIDAR data. Um, so, New York City had this LIDAR flyover where an airplane goes over um, with a LIDAR on it, shoots the laser down, calculates how long the bounce back time is, and so you get essentially the surfaces, the topography of the buildings of the city, right? So we have this LIDAR data. So we can essentially take that 3D model, and this is the, this is the LIDAR data of the Empire State Building. This is a view from the top of the Empire State Building of the LIDAR data um, by a couple of students that worked with us from CUSP. Um, so we can take this data and we can take this 3D model and essentially project it onto the 2D image plane, getting sort of feature points within the image that we then corresponding points in the LiDAR data and then essentially solve for exactly for the camera position and orientation, project that onto a 2D image plane. So along a given pixel, we know which LiDAR data point we're looking at, which XYZ data point we're looking at on the topography. But once we know X and Y, then we're golden because now we have a latitude and longitude for that pixel. And there is a data set called the Pluto data set, which stands for Public Primary Land Use Tax Lot Output, uh, which has all the shapes of all the tax lots of all the buildings in New York City. So you can take the XY position of your pixel and say which tax lot is it in. So which tax lot it in, that data set has a building identification number that's used across many, many data sets in the city. And so you can find out that before I showed you sort of the view cone, so these are the actual buildings that was the overhead shot. These are the actual buildings that we can see in the image, the footprints of them. And this is now the same image. There's no picture here. This is just color coded by distance to the pixel. Okay? So once, Gesundheit, once you can do that, now you're really golden because there's a whole host of other data sets that are geocoded, that are geotagged. So geospatial data uh, is sort of one of the fundamental data types in the city. So for example, I can go in here and say how much energy each of these buildings is using. So this is the same image where each pixel is now tagged by how much energy that building has consumed over the last year, right? So I then went sort of a step further, and this is just the distribution of those buildings with a couple of outliers that are Stuyvesant Town and a couple of hospitals. Um, you know, you can then go a step further and say, and we'll get into this more later, um, what about environmental consequences? Well, there's another data set that tells you which buildings burn heavy oils, uh, which produce pollution that's bad for you to breathe. So all the buildings that are outlined in black uh, are all buildings that are burning heavy oils. 
So essentially this is the way uh, one can sort of go in and take images and then connect those images to data sets that exist about the objects that are in those images. So then you can talk about going in and looking at how these patterns of activity correlate with energy consumption. So we've had some preliminary results on that, which I'm not going to show, which are sort of promising over the yearly time scale. But the next sort of step here is to take the sort of, uh, the, essentially the transformer data and use the building brightnesses and understanding the network to predict the transformer data that Con Ed has. Uh, this is the energy consumption per building per square foot. Right. All right. So that was the visible. Um, visible doesn't do anything for you in the daytime. So what do you do in the daytime? Uh, for that, we need infrared observations. So infrared obviously is great because unlike visible, which is mostly reflected light, infrared is telling you something about the temperature of the object, right? The infrared intensity, something like sigma t to the fourth. Right, so uh, what I'm going to show you now is an infrared time lapse of uh, almost the same scene. The top that you're looking at was up here. It's just a slightly wider view. So this is now uh, almost a whole day. So uh, this is the sun coming out. And so you can see, uh, for example, this spot right here is a copper roof, always reflective, always cold. Um, and so you have, we have time dependence, essentially, of the infrared. So uh, there are complications, of course, with the infrared. Um, the buildings do reflect infrared. Windows do reflect infrared. Um, but a lot of the complexities of that and some additional proxies, which I'll show in a second, uh, can be gleaned from the, uh, can be essentially worked around from the time dependence. Um, you know, this is, there's a whole field called building thermography where people go and they do thermographic inspections of buildings for heat leaks and things like that by walking up to the building with an infrared gun essentially and looking at the building. So here we can sort of extend that to uh, thousands of buildings at once, right? So there are some additional uh, complex factors. Uh, for example, uh, this building here is in thermal contact with the building across the street in Broadway, right? So just because they're not touching each other doesn't mean they're not in thermal contact. Um, so there's that additional complication as well. It's a coupled sort of thermal system. So here's a couple of, uh, couple of infrared images, broadband infrared images, um, that were taken from a different viewpoint. Uh, so these are separated by one minute, and in the bottom is the difference between those two. So you can see some changes. For example, you can see these guys here, which are actually little clouds coming out of the top of the buildings, which I'll talk more in a second. Um, but then there's also... Uh, this guy. Uh, so what is that? So that was a little source that changed quite a bit in infrared intensity uh, from one image to the next. So, um, you know, I can, we can do this building ID through this three-dimensional mapping. We can do this building identification. And I can go in and just say, well, what's the BBL? And this is the building. And that little spot corresponds to this HVAC event right up here. So essentially, this is what's being measured here is essentially the building's uh, uh, heating system uh, turning on, right? So this is a proxy for the energy consumption of that building. It's just one little one. You have to take them uh, in totality. But essentially, we're getting similar sort of information, which is time-dependent information about what's happening with the energy consumption in the, bu in the building. And of course, this scene, which is slightly different, you can project it. And so this is, uh, this is the same sort of scaling of energy uh, for these buildings. I'll come back to this scene in a minute. So uh, what can we actually use these for? So um, with uh, Thorsten Emick up at MIT um, and CNRS, uh, we started talking about, okay, well, can we build a model? Can you build a numerical model where you essentially take the LiDAR data Right? and essentially make a little box model where you have a whole bunch of black body radiators and uh, how are they all influencing each other? How are they heated up as the sun goes overhead? Because remember, we're taking visible observations so we can actually tell when the, when the building is being solar heated, right? so heated by the sun, uh, and then sort of solve for the, essentially the thermodynamics of the, of the whole system. And then you can sort of tie that back into the time dependence through the infrared observations. All right. So one last little bit on energy here. So um, remember how I said that we also do hyperspectral observations? So this is a field test of an instrument uh, that we had, which is a hyperspectral imager. 
basically uh, the, construct the, the instrument itself, you know, it has a CCD in the back, it has a slit in the front, light comes in through the slit, so you have vertical information, it's essentially split by a diffraction grating, and so you have wavelength information along the other axis, and then the whole thing is sort of scanned across, so then you have vertical information, horizontal information, and wavelength information, right? So, the, uh, so what we have is in the end is a data cube where we have for each pixel we have the, the intensity as a function of wavelength in 800 spectral channels for those pixels. So uh, compared to before, this was that, this was that slice of Manhattan. Uh, this is a slightly broader view. Uh, so what I did was I just, uh, so this is the spectrum here of this Powerball sign uh, in red. This is uh, just one of the pixels on the Empire State Building in blue. And this is uh, one of these sort of trees over here in green. This edge right here is the so-called chlorophyll edge. Tells you something about the vegetative health of, these, uh, of the vegetation. Um, that's during the daytime. Nighttime is potentially even more interesting. Um, but it's much lower signal to noise. And a raw scan looks like this. Right? So very, very bad, very messy data. And I was very disheartened for a while when I saw the scan and said, well, we can't do anything. Um, there are chip offsets, so I said there was a CCD in the back, there's actually two stacked on top of each other and they have different sort of offsets. Um, there are these scanning artifacts, as the thing scans across, the gain is not exactly the same, so you see these sort of ripples, right? And then there are these uh, saturation spikes where really bright sources, as the, as the electrons are being read off, uh, the, uh, the, 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 saturation, the saturation by these really bright sources sort of bleeds down. Um, but, you know, we're astronomers, so we can deal with this kind of thing. So this is now the clean version of, of this image. Basically going through row by row and column by column and removing all of those offsets and, and artifacts. Right, so now, this is exactly the same image as before. There's the Powerball sign, Empire State Building, Chrysler Building's over there. Okay, so this is sort of zoom in of the, of the Manhattan Bridge over here. This was the raw spectrum. You can see all these artifacts, and then it was cleaned in a couple of different ways. But in the end, this is sort of the resolution that we're looking at. So each one of those pixels, each one of these bright spots has a spectrum. So what do they look like? Okay, well now I've sort of color-coded the picture slightly differently. Things that are blue, spectrally, look a little bit different from things that are, say, orange. So things that are blue have these sharp spikes in them, and things that are orange have those, these smoother spectra. So these sharp spikes are coming from um, molecular lines. So this is telling you something about the composition of the source that you're looking at. In particular, what type of light you're looking at. So if you just take all of these bright sources and cluster them together and say, okay, well, how similar are, their diff how similar are the different spectra? You get something like this. So now these are the brightnesses as a function of wavelength for a whole bunch of clusters of all of the spectra in the scene. And you can see the diversity and the differences. So now you can go into, there have been measurements of lighting technologies in the lab where you measure things like uh, the spectrum of a high pressure sodium lamp or the spectrum of an incandescent light bulb or the spectrum of a, uh, of a fluorescent light. And you can say, well, are any of these things that were measured in the lab, and indeed they are. We're seeing, for example, high pressure sodiums, fluorescents, metal halide lamps, etc. So basically you can go in and you can tag for each light source the kind of lighting technology that's being used. So here's the Manhattan Bridge again. The necklace lights are one kind of LED. The lights along the road are high pressure sodium lamps, right? So these are the typical sort of lamps that sort of hang over and beam down. So those are high pressure sodiums. The uh, cars that are going along the bridge have different kind of LED headlights. Um, so I, I sort of did this tagging first and then I sort of Googled Manhattan Bridge Lights and indeed about two years ago they switched out the uh, necklace lights of the Manhattan Bridge to LEDs. So this was sort of the closest one gets in this game to a prediction. Um, so, you know... And yeah. And what's the point? In what, in what sense? <laughs> yeah, so this is... So, so you know all the different light bulbs you're using. That's right. So the kinds of things one can do with this is... Uh, is technology penetration one. So you can say, well, how are different lighting technologies being used? Because you can do building ID and then go back then, for example, to the census, which has uh, socioeconomic characteristics, et cetera, and say, how are people, uh, how, are, how are sort of different um, sectors of society relating to technology in different ways? If I was to take this uh, picture 10 years ago, this would obviously be very different. Everything would be an incandescent light bulb, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, and you can look at things like rebound effect, right? So uh, if you're talking about sort of energy budget and energy consumption and urban energy, uh, there's, this, there's, this, um, there's this 
potentially, there's this potentially non-confirmed theory out there that folks, uh, some evidence, that folks who use uh, energy efficient lighting tend to use it more, right? So we can sort of combine this with the, with the, with the on and off transitions that we were looking at before and say, well, for folks who are using energy efficient lighting, here's the sort of typical duration that they're using that lighting for. Uh, another one is sort of retrofit targets. So Con Edison has major problems. I described their grid before. They have major issues. The electrical power grid is stressed to capacity twice a year on the hottest days of the year on average. Um, this is a big issue because in the next 20 years or so, the projections are that there's going to be about a million more people in New York City that are all going to be demanding power. And it has been mandated by the city that Con Edison uh, cannot uh, essentially do any infrastructure upgrades to, to put down more lines and to upgrade the grid. So what do you need to do? You need to do demand management. So one of the things we've been discussing with Con Edison is, uh, so they've been sort of very successful at going to a building and saying, hey, you should upgrade your lighting technology. Uh, it's a great way to save energy. Uh, because when they've gone to buildings and said, hey, you should upgrade your, your, your heating, uh, they said, well, that's going to cost us a lot of money. We'll wait until we go out of spec and we'll do it later. Uh, but lighting is relatively inexpensive to upgrade. And so um, using this technology, one can then go in and say, identify targets who can have potentially, you can approach for lighting upgrades. Uh, and then, well, of course, you know, so I just, I've showed you the ones that are sort of within the catalog. There's been a lot of, I've done a lot of sort of data mining to find anomalous lighting types. Uh, and sort of figure out sort of what are the totality of different spectra, characteristic spectra that exist within urban lighting. Okay. So I think that's all I'll say about energy. Um, so we're approaching the concept of urban energy from many sort of different directions, using these techniques of sort of observation, um, astronomical techniques of sort of separating the image out into different, uh, separating the image into different individual sources and identifying information about those sources, combining and then correlating with internal data sets from the city. Um, then using the sort of three-dimensional topography to give us information about what we're actually looking at in the image. So there's also this question of environmental impacts, right? So as the city uses energy, that does, uh, as the, that that does cause an environmental impact, right? We talked in the beginning about the complex system, the complex urban system, you know, people interacting with the built environment and the consequences that might have for the natural environment. So what can we say about that? So uh, this is uh, another paper by Constantine, actually, and also Rishi Jain and Jose Moura. Um, so there are, from the local law 84 data, we know which, uh, we know what types of fuel different buildings are burning, so we can sort of approximate what kinds of uh, pollutants they're putting into the atmosphere, particulate matter 2.5, noxes, etc. Um, and there's been a lot of work sort of modeling how those pollutants might disperse sort of through the urban environment. Um, typically, shockingly, those models uh, assume sort of Gaussian diffusion, right? So you have a bunch of point sources, and they're diffusing away in sort of Gaussian uh, circularly symmetric shells. And then so the point of this was essentially how much is a building nearby sort of affected by the, uh, by the buildings who are burning these sort of heavy oils, right? But this isn't the whole story. So one way of sort of seeing that is to look at the daytime images that we're taking. So this is now 11 o'clock uh, in the morning. This is 11 o'clock and 30 seconds. And this is 11 o'clock and one minute. So these images essentially look exactly the same. There's a boat in that one, but it's very hard to sort of tell the differences. So what we can do is something actually very similar to what an astronomer might do to detect light echoes, for example, for those of you who know what light echoes are. Um, they are as, the, as a supernova explodes, it sends out uh, a sh uh, essentially light rays shooting outwards. As they reflect off of dust, you see an expanding sort of ring. Um, so what we can do is we can take a sequence of images and use that to essentially subtract off everything that's constant and only look at the things that are changing in the image. Uh, in computer vision, this is called background subtraction or foreground background separation. Uh, and so what I'm going to show you is in the top is going to be a one minute time lapse of the daytime out of that 24 hour time lapse. In the bottom is going to be the exact same time lapse, but I've removed everything that is constant in the image, like the buildings, for example. So you'll see the cars going along the road and you'll see the boats going along the river. Um, so I'm roughly halfway through. You can see this plume coming out of one of the buildings. <coughs> 
right? So hard to see if you sort of squint, you can kind of see it as you look up there. But with a little bit of image processing, uh, these things pop out clear as day. So once you actually sort of have this, you can sort of identify, uh, you can sort of grab onto the plume and track it as it goes, looking at things like uh, uh, color change, uh, changes in color space and sort of probabilistic matching for how the plume is actually moving using various Kalman filters, etc. Um, and then so in the top, sorry, in the top panel here, I've sort of tagged everything that's sort of plumish as, as red. So then, right, so that, so before we we're talking about the circularly symmetric diffusion of things that are being emitted from buildings, well, if I'm sitting over here and I'm a building over here, I'm actually not being affected because of urban winds. Right? And in particular, so it should also be noted that so PM 2.5 is the bad stuff, the stuff that you don't want to breathe in. It's the thing that's regulated by the EPA, for example. Um, and there are sensors in the city that measure PM 2.5 sitting on top of a bunch of buildings. Uh, within the whole of New York City, there's about a dozen such sensors. So they're not really giving you granular data. Um, and if, in particular, if I was a sensor sitting over here, I would never know that that plume even happened. Right? So by doing this persistently over time, you can get things like plume rates, like when, how many times plumes come out of a given building, the so repeaters, for example, the total number of plumes that are produced in a given scene. You can actually use the traces of this to constrain models of sort of flow through the urban terrain, um, which, is, uh, which, which some folks do through numerical simulations. Looking at the color changes, one can actually start to separate out carbon and steam, but I'll say a lot more about that in a second. Um, and you can also do what in astronomy would be called a target of opportunity observation. So you see something and you say, wow, that's interesting. Let me train all my other uh, imagers on that object. What kind of imager? Uh, something like a long wave infrared hyperspectral imager. So this uh, was, uh, so now we're doing hyperspectral imaging, though uh, at the long wavelength infrared. Not at, before we're looking at the visible and near infrared from about 400 nanometers up to about 1100 nanometers. Now we're looking at the long wave infrared, so about 10 microns or so. Near to 10 microns. So uh, we did a field test of one of these instruments from the Stevens Institute, which is over there in Hoboken. And we got essentially the west side of Manhattan. This is a picture of the instrument. Uh, it has to be cooled, so it has to be cooled by liquid helium. Uh, and it does essentially the same thing, it scans across. So this is a picture of the view. The picture of the view from Stevens is great. You should go out to Hoboken and, and sort of check it out. It's really quite beautiful. You can see all the way essentially up and down the island. Um, but this is essentially what we're looking at. And this is now the, the sort of broadband, the integrated over the full spectrum of that scene. So this is essentially the west side of Manhattan uh, in the infrared. So you know, if you go in here and sort of pick out 100 sort of random spectra, they look something like this. So you have sort of, it kind of looks like maybe it's kind of a black body, it's peaking at roughly the right spot, around, around 10 microns, which gives you something like 50 degrees, Celsius, uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. This was done in April. Um, you see also all these little wiggles that at first you might think are noise if you look at an original one, at a uh, single spectrum in isolation, but uh, there are actually features that correspond to both water vapor uh, and also the actual building materials themselves. So let's, Let's sort of see if we can break this down uh, and see if we can develop a good model for essentially what we're seeing here. So the first thing you might do, the first thing that many folks try to do uh, when you're trying to essentially reduce the dimensionality of this is principal component analysis. So I built a PCA model, right? So this is the mean spectrum and here are just the first six principal components. Um, so uh, for those of you who aren't, who aren't familiar with PCA, PCA essentially takes uh, uh, a set of data and breaks it up into orthogonal components uh, which successively represent uh, the amount of variance uh, each component has in the, uh, in the data set. So the first principal component, which actually turns out, this, so this is a very nicely fit by a black body at roughly, uh, roughly 50 Fahrenheit, by the way. Uh, this, is, this is the effect of essentially water vapor uh, along the line of sight. And the others are sort of making up for various effects. This one's kind of instrumental. Um, and there's sort of, this is an increase in decreasing order of the amount of variance in the data set. So then how does our model look? We can use that and say sort of predict the data we were looking at. So there's the data and there's the PCA model. And if you make the residual, it looks very nice, right? Very good, we've subtracted almost everything. This one's really bright, probably not too surprising, maybe 
that our model is failing a little bit here. Right, so it is rough with, with the, so we went out to 20. So with the first six components, it's about 80-ish percent and going out to about 95% uh, by the time you get to 20. Oh yeah, it's quite good. The PCA model is very, very good. Yes. Um, great, so that's integrated over all wavelengths. So essentially all of these wavelengths. So this is a picture integrated over all wavelengths. This is the PCA model which is done on an individual wavelength basis and then integrated over all wavelengths. And this is now the difference of the two. Well, what if I look at, let's say, 10.35 microns, right? Instead of looking at integrated. Now, how do I do? Well, there's my data at 10.35 microns. There's my PCA model at 10.35 microns. And there's the difference between them. So now there's something happening here, right? So why is 10.3 micron, 10.35 microns in, of interest? Uh, so this is the, uh, the emission spectrum of the ammonia molecule, right? So it has a nice peak here, right, at 10.35 microns, which is actually showing up in absorption, actually. So I wasn't, uh, I wasn't sort of Nostradamus here. I didn't, uh, I didn't say, oh, we should look at 10.35 microns. Um, we, have spectral, uh, we have spectral libraries, which we go through the residual, and we essentially do matched filtering across the residual and say, well, what do we see? And so here, for example, is a detection using a matched filter of ammonia that's being generated by the buildings, right? So we actually, you know, one of the first things I said in, that, in the slide on the Urban Observatory, there were those three things. One of them was persistent. So uh, we did this for eight days. We took about a cube a minute, and then we started doing, uh, then we started doing slightly more high cadence observations to look for short time scale changes. Um, this is roughly the number of data cubes that we had. And here is just uh, a preliminary sort of, this is what we detected in each of the data cubes. There were about 10,000 detections of ammonia. There was a lot of detection of Freon-22, uh, which is... Uh, now a, it's a being phased out uh, by, uh, by 2020. It's, uh, you essentially can't buy it anymore. Uh, it's very toxic for, the, uh, toxic for the environment. And it's essentially set to be completely phased out in use um, by 2020. One of the interesting things is not only did we detect Freon-22, but it was essentially leaking, continuously being spewed out of a building. So there's clearly some kind of leak happening. Uh, things, like, uh, things like methane also detected. Um, carbon dioxide, so CO2, talking about environmental impacts, and also acetone. Okay, so I am just about out of time. So uh, just to sort of wrap up here, so as I said in the beginning, we're sort of still in our infancy. So literally when I walked in the door two years ago, that 24-hour time lapse out of the window that I showed in the beginning, that's all we had. And so over the past two years, we've essentially, uh, we've, we've gone through um, imaging in the visible, persistent imaging in the visible, imaging in the broadband infrared, hyperspectral in the visible uh, and near infrared, and also hyperspectral in the long wave. Sort of testing these out and saying, okay, well, what are the kinds of things we can do to study the city, right? This is not like, you know, this is, though, though our data rates are comparable to sort of a medium-sized astronomical observatory, right? So we get about 50 terabytes a year worth of imaging data. Um, you know, this is new, right? This is not LSST where there's, been, where there's been essentially proofs of concept before and where we know essentially what were the kinds of things we want to look at and to sort of make the incremental change. Um, this is essentially a new way of observing the city. And so the kinds of things that we've been sort of looking at and our sort of direction forward has been on some of these sort of big topics for both the city um, and for, the, for New York City and for cities throughout the world. So identifying aggregate patterns of behavior, which we can sort of use to quantify how sort of the humans, they interact with the built structures, and then how those, in, in, those interactions sort of manifest themselves in energy consumption, right, which has sort of directly observable consequences for the natural environment through some of the imaging of the plumes. So, you know, the way that we're doing this is with some of the sort of methodological tools, like some of the hypothesis testing. So like, for example, um, you know, there, the hypothesis, for example, was that we would see anything in the long wave infrared at all. The, the, there was no guarantee that that was going to happen. There's been some observations of cities overhead. Uh, the instrument was essentially designed to sort of fly over. Uh, there were some observations of cities in the long wave like infrared hyperspectral that were done with flyovers, but none of the side facing stuff. And the persistence in being able to detect things over time was sort of not, not known. We thought we could do it. We 
made a few calculations about what we should see. Um, and we basically got there. Physical principles, so essentially, you know, we're, we're taking observations like the infrared, for example, that can be directly used to model urban thermodynamics. So how different buildings sort of interact with each other as heat flows through them, as humans use them, right? And data analysis techniques from both astronomy and physics. Um, so this is sort of the first time that we're sort of doing this. Uh, and the sort of the consequences are, are sort of uh, are sort of profound for ways in which we can understand how the city functions, uh, the impact that that city has on the world around it, and on the sort of quality of life for the people who are in the end sort of breathing that air and are sort of sitting inside the urban heat island. Um, and I will stop there. Thanks. Where is the ammonia coming from? So that's a really good question. Um, we're not entirely sure, um, but ammonia is used in the cleaning agents for the, uh, essentially the fuel towers. So the, you can take those ammonia clouds and say, you know, we did the building ID for where all those buildings are. Uh, and we can say, well, it looks like some of the ammonia clouds are coming from these buildings that are essentially burning oils and they have these tankers, right? So the, the, the thinking is, is that some of this ammonia is coming from, uh, coming from the cleaning agents that are used within the tankers because those use ammonia. Another example of this is uh, we detected acetone, um, an acetone plume. Uh, so then I went into Google Earth and looked at where the building was on uh, Street View and there is, uh, there is a cleaner. Uh, dry cleaner, right underneath the acetone plume, and they use acetone in uh, dry cleaning. What are the concentrations you detect of like acetone and ammonia? Like, how do they compare to the like gas toxic for humans? Right, so um, we don't have the concentrations yet. So the concentrations are sort of hard to actually get at. So you can say that, because basically there's a path length issue, right? You can say that there's some absorption, but you don't actually know sort of the depth that you're looking through, right? Uh, and so there's a couple of ways that we're, that we're sort of looking at, maybe using standards mm -hmm. that are kind of behind the thing from previous frames to say, okay, well, this is how much absorption is happening. We can make an estimate given some sort of like spherical model for what the plume actually looks like to say what the concentration is that gives us this absorption or this amount of emission, right? Because um, it depends on whether you're looking against the cool sky or the warmer buildings, whether you see uh, emission or absorption. Um, that said, uh, I, can, I didn't actually show it here. We did a couple of controlled releases where we had uh, some folks stand on the pier and essentially shoot dust off which is like a, you know, like a screen cleaner kind of thing, um, and uh, sort of saw, saw what we could see. And uh, the, certainly the concentrations that we're seeing are less than from, say, a can of dust off. But that was a one-time release. And you know, we're seeing a lot of plumes, right? So there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of sort of stuff coming out. So the next sort of stage here is to take all those scans and stack them together and say, okay, well, what's the sort of steady state that's happening? Like, is there like a cloud of ammonia hanging over New York City? Can you actually see that in the long wavelength infrared? Uh, uh, um, so, uh, I think all of the imaging that's more like astronomy is, you know, I, I get to this nice, the results are good. So at the beginning, you were talking about lots of fancy words like complex systems and emergent and stuff. And yeah. Certainly in the city, it's very complicated. Yeah. Right, so the, so the first sort of, so there are, so for example, if you look at energy consumption from buildings, there are patterns which, there are patterns which emerge and they're sort of spatially varying, but they have this sort of scale length, right? So those patterns are essentially coming from, the, en the energy consumption in the building is being done by the humans, right? So that the mobility of the, the mobility of the human component is tying into sort of the energy consumption in the buildings. So one of the things that, uh, that we're sort of, one of the directions we're starting to go is a way to sort of tie the mobility of people, which in itself has its own patterns, which then feed into the energy consumption of individual buildings. So how might you get at mobility of people? Um, there's a couple of different ways, uh, but the one that we're going to, the one that we're, we've sort of started down the path of is, 
uh, using um, publicly available Department of Transportation camera feeds to essentially count the number of people in locations over time so that you can get essentially a density map of people over time and the way that then that feeds into the energy consumption of buildings. So there's a pattern that's essentially, that's driving another pattern and there's some function which, which turns the mobility of the, of the people into the consumption of the buildings. So now there's other sort of, there's other sort of data that has to come into that, like how many units are in a building, right? That kind of thing. How many workers are in a location? So, so that's sort of, and then once you, do, once you have sort of that, there's then the correlation of um, plumes coming out of those buildings, right? And the sort of long-term impacts of the, this, the patterns of plumes coming out of those buildings and the long-term impacts of those plumes on the environment. So essentially the human mobility feeding in through the buildings out into the environment is the sort of interconnected structure that we're looking for. But we're a ways off still. Yeah. Uh, given all this energy that is dissipated around us, yeah. how much uh, temperature outside in the middle of, uh, of the street, how much air temperature is greater because of energy consumption in the, in the building? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, nobody knows that for sure. So there is, there's been a lot of work done on what's called the urban heat island effect where when you put a lot of buildings together, they sort of all couple and it gets warmer inside, right? Um, so uh, the, if you go out and you sort of measure the, the temperature as a function of time uh, outside of the city versus inside of the city, it tends to look like a few degree difference on average throughout the year, um, Fahrenheit, uh, throughout the year. So um, that's hard to, it's sort of hard to get a handle on, and it has the actual simulation, the thermodynamic simulation has actually never been done for a whole city. So um, the hope is, is that we can actually use the observations from the infrared tying in with the, with the actual shapes from the LIDAR data um, to actually run just a very simple sort of box model where the buildings are interacting and you have some boundary layer that's setting your um, boundary conditions and then say, okay, well, do we see sort of from that model, do we see sort of similar uh, uh, level of temperature increase compared to non-urban settings? So, but on the order of a few degrees. But that can be absorption of sunlight, right? Right. So there's, I mean, so there's, there's, al there's also the absorption of sunlight. So the, 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 this is, uh, so to get into the, com the complexity of this a little bit, so for a given building, the infrared coming off of it um, is essentially due to three things, right? So it's due to some of the reflection from the sunlight, it's due to the heating from the sunlight, but then it's also due to sort of the inter what's happening internally, right? And then it's causing the heating. So um, the, the heating, the reflection from the sunlight is very, very tricky because how do you actually get rid of that? So you can estimate sort of how much is being reflected using time dependence. So you can see using the visible imaging and the time dependence as the sun goes overhead, you can sort of estimate how much is being reflected. You can also use cloud cover, right? When a cloud goes over, all of a sudden you're reflecting less. So you can use that and then you see the infrared intensity drop, you can use that. The heating from the sun has a lag, right? So there's a phase lag because uh, it, it takes some time for a building to heat up from the sun. And you can actually see that. If you look at the temperature envelopes of the buildings as a function of, uh, as a function of time and then overlay just the ambient temperature as a function of time, you can see the phase lag, right? So that's due to heating. So that's of the order of a, of the order of a 10 percent effect or something like that. Um, so with the time dependence, you can, you can start to sort of disentangle some of these complexities. Yes, so winds are, winds are also another competing factor. Winds sort of, uh, winds advect the heat away from the surfaces of buildings as well. Let, let's take last two questions. It was Mark, our guest professor, and, and then we'll continue on the uh, wine and cheese. So you made the case, I think it's pretty convincing, that low resolution data sets have an incredibly rich amount of information. Yeah. And you also made the case that when you combine these data sets, you get even more information out of them. Yes. And you made the case that this information is virtually valuable. Con Ed would like to know who's using what light bulbs. Sure. Right? And it seems that as you collect more data and have more analysis techniques, mm -hmm. it is going to become an even richer data set that's even more valuable. And at some point, it seems like things could go very wrong. Even if your data, mm -hmm. you know, the methods you were developing certainly it seems like people would say, you know, people, if you use our methods that you're developing and take these data sets and 
before it's been discovered. Mm -hmm. You can tell very personal things about people's energy use, their consumption habits, whether they've upgraded their lighting, whether they watch a flat screen TV or, or so on, right? Which would be uh, in, in kind of lead to things that perhaps some people would say we wouldn't want out there, right? Sure. Um, so on the other side of this, what? <laughs> they know a lot more than that, I'll tell you. The credit card companies know even more, but we won't go there. You know, there is a difference, right? Because when I use Google, I sign an agreement. And it to you, right? When I use a credit card, I sign a credit card agreement, right? You're not getting an agreement with people, right? Even in principle, right? And so even if you accept all these things, there is a difference, right? But so the other question, though, is what is the benefit mm. of this research, right? Right. And so can you give an example of like how this kind of thing provides a clear benefit that kind of mitigates your... Absolutely. So I think, so we can talk about some of the ones that we already, I mean, we can talk about some of the ones we already talked about. Uh, right now, for example, the um, Department of Environmental Protection has folks who look at pictures and estimate the amount of um, aerosols in the air by eye. And they have to periodically go through training where they calibrate their eyeballs, right? Um, we can take, we can get that information directly from an image. We can not only do it in one spot, we can do it all over the place, right? Um, the Department of Environmental Protection has a dozen air quality sensors um, throughout the city that are measuring something about the local air quality, regardless of what's happening with winds or anything like that. We can measure what the air quality is across the whole city granularly at one point in time. We can also say what's actually contributing to that. Um, you know, the, we, we didn't really talk about sort of the, the health impacts of things, but like for example, if you look at light patterns, aggregate light patterns, and you say, well, let me correlate changes in those light patterns with light pollution, because you can measure ambient light pollution. Block out all the point sources, look at the diffuse light, and say, well, how do those light patterns change when there's a spotlight on a building, for example? Is that disturbing people's sleep-wake cycles? Right? So that's a public health problem um, that is sort of broadly acknowledged. Um, you can combine lighting pattern changes with 311 calls or noise complaint calls, for example, and say, okay, well, how is noise in the city, which is the number one thing that people complain about? How is that affecting their sort of daily pattern of their sort of daily circadian rhythm? Um, I, I, can, I can keep going, but anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. No, directly. Sure, sure. There, there seems to be one difference between stars and windows. And there's, yeah, there's a lot, though. Go ahead. Well, one of the things that stars, you assume that the stars you're not looking at are very similar to the ones that you're looking at. Yeah. Here you're looking at energy and light consumption yeah. of the people you see. They happen to live in penthouses and views in East River. Definitely. The people you don't see are not living there. Definitely. Well, so, the yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Uh, I'll paraphrase the question. Um, there is occlusion effects that you need to take into account. So the, what the scene that we're looking at here is very layered, right? So actually, the claim was that everybody we're looking at is in a penthouse. That's not totally true. So these are all public, these are all public housing projects down here. Uh, yes, these are sort of maybe more high-rise stuff over here. These are mostly commercial buildings. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so there's occlusion effects. We can't see every building, right? That is, and in fact, for the buildings that we can see, we don't see all of them. Um, so one of the things that we did, I didn't show it here with a couple of students last, uh, last year, uh, for one of their capstones, we were looking at these correlations between energy consumption and lighting. And what we did was we took the, we took the LIDAR data and we projected it as we see it here. And then for a given building, we removed the other buildings that were in front of it in the LIDAR data set and projected and said, well, what fraction of the building are we looking at? Right? And then also said, okay, from the other side, so what's, what's the total amount of the building that we're looking at? And then essentially kind of corrected for that in terms of how much the building is sort of being, how much, how much of the building is occupied. Um, and then once you do that correction, there is actually kind of a correlation with energy consumption. So uh, the hope is that you can correct for some of these effects, but uh, A, yes, you're always going to be limited by that to some extent and you have to make certain corrections. Uh, B, um, the extent to which you, have, you do have diversity. So with stars, yes, you're assuming the stars you're looking at are, are the same as the, as the ones you've seen before. Um, 
Yeah, the more diversity you have, the better in our case, actually, because we have this we have this supplementary data that we can then correlate um, to look for sort of interesting patterns. 